Welcome to ADP Training, YouTube's automotive technology channel. In this channel, you'll learn all kinds of auto repair secrets, how your automobile works, and how to diagnose it. Audi Valve Lift System Valve Timing Audi Valve Lift System was introduced in the 2.8-liter, direct injection, V6 and will be expanded for use in other members of the V6 and V8 family. The Audi Valve Lift System is a cam lobe swapping type. Audi engines have already been carrying the variable valve timing for many years, and this is in addition of valve lift. Compared with Honda or Toyota systems, Audi is a simpler and more efficient system. It actuates the variable lift, without using complex intermediate shafts, like hydraulically operated rocker arms, and it saves space and weight while reducing frictional loss. How can Audi do that? The answer is in the valve lift system, which the cam pieces, can slide in a longitudinal direction to change the actuating cams. In other words, the cam lobes slide back and forth. Each valve can be actuated by a fast cam at half an inch, or a slow cam at a quarter inch in the intake valve, and sixteenth of an inch in the other valve, so as to create swirl in the airflow for better fuel atomization at low speed. The two cams are mounted on a single camshaft piece, which acts on the roller cam follower depending on the longitudinal position of cam piece. The entire actuation process is controlled by a pair of metal pins, incorporated at the valve covers, and powered by lightning fast electromagnetic actuators. Two of them are responsible for each cam element. There is a spiral groove machine into the camshaft. When the metal pins are lowered, it engages the spiral groove on the camshaft, and pushes the cam piece by about 3 eighths of an inch in longitudinal direction. A spring-loaded latch, will lock the cam piece in the new position. In this way, the operating cams are changed from one set to another. To change to another cam, the metal pin presses against a reverse spiral groove, and moves the cam lobe piece back to the original position. The cam piece is locked by the spring-loaded latch again. The change from one cam set to the next, takes one combustion cycle, or two engine revolutions. Audi pre-programmed the ignition and electronic throttle, to smoothen the transition between the two cam sets, and the change can be hardly detectable. Theoretically, the Audi valve lift system should deliver better power than other manufacturers, but in the 2.8-liter V6, its priority is put on fuel economy. Audi also uses this technical system to its advantage, in its performance engines. The Audi valve lift system enables the volume of air drawn in to be controlled to a large extent by the opening of the inlet valves. The throttle butterfly can remain fully open even under partial load and the undesirable choke losses are considerably reduced. Its uncomplicated design means that it can cope with engine speeds of up to 7000 RPMs, so it can deliver high peak performance. Dodge VVT Valve Timing Dodge Chrysler has also hopped in the electronic variable valve timing bandwagon. Different versions of VVT technology exist, including the ability to switch camshaft lobes to affect valve lift, duration and timing to suit varying operational needs. 
More common are engines that use a phaser to adjust camshaft position or valve timing. Mechanical, hydraulic and electrical controls are now part of VVT engines. Motor oil is used as the hydraulic medium that makes VVT work. Dodge Chrysler use various VVT schemes, and here's one developed by Borg Warner Corporation. Right through the camshaft, oil enters the passages to the camshaft phaser. The phaser is a mechanical device with two main pieces, the rotor, and the phaser body. The oil control solenoid, feeds and vents the oil passages. Oil flows into and out of passageways, inside the camshaft. The phaser body is physically bolted to the camshaft sprocket. The rotor, is linked to the camshaft, with a torque bolt. The two pieces are able to move about 35 to 45 camshaft degrees independently of each other. So in essence, the camshaft belt or chain sprocket is not tightly attached to the camshaft itself. Passages in the phaser direct oil in, or out of eight chambers. Four chambers are considered side A, and the other four are side B. As the A group of chambers receives pressurized oil, the side B chambers are vented to provide the force necessary to move or hold the rotor relative to the phaser sprocket body. Oil seals are used at the rotor to provide a tight seal between the chambers. Discharged oil from the phaser side goes back through the camshaft, through the oil control solenoid, and drains into the front timing cover. Some units have a mechanical device inside the phaser known as a lock pin. The spring-loaded pin on the rotor engages into the phaser body to lock the two pieces together during specific engine operations. The lock pin also prevents noise and wear tear upon engine start. Oil pressure is required to disengage the lock pin. Chrysler engines also featured a spring pin on the exhaust camshaft. Locked phaser positions on this engine are full retard on the intake and full advance on the exhaust. Due to the clockwise rotation of the engine, the exhaust rotor requires additional assistance in reaching the full advance position. In the lock position, there is no valve overlap. It should be noted that service information does not recommend phaser disassembly and individual parts are unavailable by the manufacturers, but other aftermarket companies are already offering these components, as whole units, and in parts. The racing high-performance industry has also benefited from this technology by offering entire line of low and high RPM phasers, engine computers and solenoids. Variations of this technology using electrical motors are also covered elsewhere in this series. Dodge Chrysler VVT electronic valve timing technology is here to stay. It is up to you to get trained on it. Ford CTA Valve Timing Ford uses two basic electronic valve timing schemes, the TI, VCT, and the CTA or cam torque actuated valve timing. The two types of valve timing work totally different. Feel free to view our other article on Ford TI, VCT. Here, we'll go deeper into the torque actuated, or CTA system, which was developed by Borg Warner Corporation. The majority of these VVT systems use oil pressure to push the rotor back and forth. Oil pressure actuated valve timing, like TVCT systems require a large oil pump to generate the extra pressure that's required to work the cam phasers, which sucks some of the fuel economy gains of TVCT. With a large oil pump, all driven systems don't work well at low engine speeds, because the pump doesn't build enough pressure and volume, until the RPMs go higher. The CTA valve timing avoids these drawbacks by moving oil inside the CAM sprockets, using the resistance or torque that the valve springs put on the camshaft. When a cam low pushes a valve open, the valve spring resists that force and pushes back. Also, when the valve spring pushes a valve closed, it also pushes on the cam lobe in the opposite direction from the valve opening. During the entire CAM rotation, there is enough energy from these open and close forces to make cam phasing work. 
The CAM phaser is controlled by a solenoid in the CAM phasing rotor that directs the flow. With the valve open in one direction, oil flows into only one side of the oil pockets and can't leave. By actuating the PWM solenoid, the precise amount of oil can flow on either side of the rotor lobes. The key advantages of the CTA system are that it responds quickly even at idle and can operate using a standard engine's oil pump. The downside is that as engine speeds increase, the CTA system becomes less effective. This is due to the fact that the CAM open and lobe events happen too close to each other. For example, valve openings and closings in an inline 6 are spaced too closely for the size M to work well. But a V6, which is really two three cylinders put together, is perfectly suited because there isn't as much overlap between each valve event. The system also works well on four and V8 engines. You can find the CTA valve timing on the Ford 5.0 liter V8, as well as the V8 engines used in Jaguar and Land Rover VLS. These engines show efficiencies in the low RPM range that lend themselves to these type of vehicles. Ford TVCT Ford names their variable camshaft or valve timing, TVCT. The Ford family of engines now offered, use a double overhead camshaft configuration that uses two camshafts per cylinder bank, one camshaft to operate the intake valves, and one camshaft to operate the exhaust valves. Normally, car makers have only been able to open the valves at a fixed point, developed at engine design and manufacturing. With modern variable cam timing systems, the camshaft sprocket or phasers can be rotated a few degrees or between 45 and 50 degrees, relative to their initial position, letting the cam timing to be advanced or retarded. The rotor or sprocket wings have two sides, the hydraulic advance and retard sides. By controlling the oil pressure flow between the advance and retard sprocket chambers, the valve timing is adjusted. During cold start, or extreme operation, the TVCT system is in passive mode, and a locking pin locks the CAM sprocket together. Passive mode also has minimum valve overlap. TVCT from Ford, takes this technology and applies it to both the intake and exhaust camshafts, and also the EGR valve is eliminated. Ford models use electronic pulse with modulated solenoids, to flow high pressure oil to control vanes in each of the camshaft sprocket housings. The Ford TVCT solenoid has four hydraulic oil channels. The tip is the oil incoming oil, the side advance and retard oil channels, and a cylinder head oil back drain channel. A cylindrical valve inside the solenoid direct the oil to its right passageway. By operating the VCT solenoid to hydraulic advance, retard, and drain, the desired valve timing is achieved. The exact position of the solenoid cylindrical valve is a factor of the pulse width modulated duty cycle. By using one PWM solenoid per camshaft, controlled by the electronic control module, each intake and exhaust cam can be advanced or retarded independently of the other, as engine operating conditions change, providing a certain degree of valve timing control. The Ford uses a TVCT system actuated with assistance from pressurized oil. The system works in closed loop. The solenoid valves allow precise timing of camshaft position, depending on ECM commands. The system is now broadly used by Ford on many of its engines, from 4 to 8, and it's a technology here to stay. Mercedes-Benz Camtronic Valve Timing Mercedes-Benz introduced its Camtronic Variable Valve Lift System on the M270, used on the C-Class Series 4-cylinder engine in 2012. Called Camtronic, its main purpose is not to increase power, but to increase fuel efficiency. At light or part load, 
the Camtronic switches to a low lift cam profile to limit the amount of air intake, and at the same time the throttle butterfly can remain wide open and reduce pumping loss. This is similar to BMW's Valvetronic system that uses an electric motor and is discussed elsewhere in this series. But, the Camtronic is a two-stage system, rather than continuously variable. The mechanism of Camtronic is pretty simple. The intake camshaft is served with a conventional variable cam phasing actuator at the end of it, as well as the Camtronic variable valve lift electric actuator normally mounted at the top of the head. The camshaft itself consists of an inner splined carrier shaft, and two hollow cam low pieces, each serving two adjacent cylinders. Mercedes-Benz engineers refer to these as cam pieces, of which the first controls the intake valves of cylinders 1 and 2, and the second those of cylinders 3 and 4. Each cam has two cam lift profiles, or low and high lift. The cam profile that is engaged depends on the longitudinal slide position of the cam low pieces. If the ECM needs to switch cam profiles, a centrally mounted actuator applies steel pins to the grooves on the cam pieces. In this way, the rotation of camshaft causes the cam pieces to slide in a back and forth direction, and engage the different cam profiles within a single engine revolution. The Camtronic valve system is similar to Audi's valve lift, but it uses fewer cam pieces and one actuator, thus is cost effective to build. Mercedes used both the butterfly valve or normal throttle valve and the dual profile Camtronic system to accelerate the engine. As the torque increases, the valve lift is switched to the higher profile, and load control once again being conventional via the throttle butterfly valve, or in the turbocharged operating range, via the charging level of the turbocharger. The switch cover from the smaller to the larger valve lift goes unnoticed by the driver. As cylinders 1 and 2 as well as 3 and 4 are coupled in pairs with one cam piece each, it is possible to adjust the valve lift of all four cylinders within one camshaft revolution using just one electric actuator. Mercedes worked very hard to develop the synchronization for the switching process, and ensure a tough durability of the components. The variable Hydraulic vane type camshaft adjusters on the intake and exhaust sides have a wide adjustment range of 40 degrees with reference to the crankshaft. In many ways, the Mercedes-Benz Camtronic valve timing system is built with tried and tested technology. It uses technology similar to other manufacturers, but typical of Mercedes conservative thinking, they chose the best of each technology to carry their brand forward. Nissan NEO VVL Valve Timing Nissan Motor Company has what is called Nissan Ecology Orientated Variable Valve Lift and Timing. The NEO VVL engine was developed by Nissan around 1997. It's all limited release on some models. This in essence is a system similar to the Honda VTEC Valve Lift system, but is also has variable valve timing. This means that on a given rotational range, the engine will change the lift and timing on the intake and exhaust cam independently. The NEO VVL engine has a camshaft with two different cam low profiles. When one cam profile is no longer needed or after 5000 RPMs, the lift profile changes and allows the engine to keep putting out power all the way to the red line. NEO VVL engines can generally rev to around 8200 RPMs in stock form. This in effect has the best of both worlds, a great idle response and high RPM power. The Neo VVL engine changes the cam profiles independently. The intake cam changes first, and then the exhaust camshaft thereafter. Other manufacturers, like Honda's VTEC and Toyota's VVTi switch both cams together. The end result is greater power generation on the smooth side. The Nissan Neo VVL uses two separate camshaft profiles. One profile works best at low RPMs, 
while the other is meant for higher engine revolutions. It also uses three activation stages. The low and high RPM profiles are affected by means of a rocker arm latching mechanism. The rocker arm latch is actuated by means of a latching pin. During low RPM, the outer camshaft lobe is the one doing the work. As engine speed goes higher, or at the discretion of the engine control computer or ECM, the hydraulic solenoid affects the rocker arm latching pin. At this point, the latch pin catches the upper lip of the inner rocker arm. In effect, this makes the dual rocker arm act as one. With the latch pin not protruding, the lower RPM camshaft profile or low lift is then again affected. The system is very fast and its simplicity is very effective. There are variations of this Nissan system and rocker arm mechanisms, but the operation is the same. You might think this must be a two-stage system, like the Honda VTEC. No, it is not. Since Nissan Neo VVL duplicates the same mechanism in the exhaust camshaft as well, three operational stages can be obtained in the following way. Stage 1, low speed. Both intake and exhaust valves are in low camshaft lobe configuration, or outer lobes. Stage 2, medium speed. High lift intake configuration and low lift exhaust configuration. Stage 3, high speed. Both intake and exhaust valves are in high lift configuration. The system works fairly smooth and provides a flatter response throughout the entire RPM range. Porsche Variacom Plus Valve Timing Variocam is an automobile variable valve timing technology developed by Porsche. Variocam varies the timing of the valves by adjusting the tension on the timing chain, connecting the intake and exhaust camshafts. The Porsche Variacom was first introduced to the model 968 in 1991 on the 3.0 liter engine. It used a timing chain to vary the phase angle of the camshaft thus provided a variable valve timing scheme. The 996 Carrera and 986 Boxster also used the same system, but further refined. The Variacom Plus, used in the 996 Turbo finally executed the trend of using hydraulic cam phasers instead of chain. However, the most influential changes of the Variacom Plus is the addition of variable valve lift. It is implemented by using variable hydraulic tappets, with an attachment pin. As shown, each valve is served by three cam lobes, the center one, has obviously less lift and a shorter duration valve opening. In other words, it is the slow cam. The outer two cam lobes are the same, with fast timing and high lift. The selection of the cam lobe scheme is made by the ECM hydraulic solenoid and variable tappet, which actually consists of an inner tappet and an outer ring shaped tappet. They could be locked together by a hydraulically operated pin, passing through the valve stem. In this way, the fast or high cam lobes actuate the valve, providing high lift and long duration opening. If the tappets are not locked together, the valve will be actuated by the slow low cam lobe, via the inner tappet. And the outer tappet will move independent of the valve lifter. The variable lift mechanism is unusually simple and saves a lot of space. The variable tappets are just lightly heavier than ordinary tappets, and require not much more space to operate. With an automatic chain tensioner, and hydraulic valve lash compensation, Variocam alters camshaft timing for greater engine torque. Since there are effectively two cam schemes on each intake camshaft, it is possible to apply two different valve lift graphing curves. The phase angle, or timing, on each of the cams can be advanced or retarded, using an electrohydraulically actuated adjuster. Variocam Plus offers a number of benefits, when starting the engine from cold. Combustion is improved during the warm-up process, thereby reducing emissions. The system also provides smoother idling, while enhancing fuel economy. Variocam Plus uses a long positive overlap, 
or increases the period during which both valves are open simultaneously, as a means of maximizing fuel efficiency. Since a relatively high proportion of exhaust gas is present during combustion, there is also a significant reduction in NOx emissions. In full throttle mode, or large cam profile, high lift, and optimum performance, the valves are adjusted for optimum power and torque. The valve lift is switched to the high cam setting, enabling maximum torque output of 412 foot-pounds on the 911 turbo, from as low as 2700 RPMs. The curve remains flat all the way to 5800 RPMs, covering a significant flat portion of the engine speed range. Toyota valve matic valve timing Toyota joined the Electronic Valve Timing and Lift Club in 2008, with its valve matic technology. Compare with BMW Valvetronic, and Nissan VVEL, valve matic is different in some aspects. Its construction is relatively simple, it is compact and does not increase the height of cylinder head. It improves the power output by 10%, while reduces in 15%, the fuel consumption during regular driving. Most importantly, it adds little inertia and friction, thus, does not compromise top end power. Valvematic employs an intermediate shaft to achieve continuous variable valve lift. The intermediate shaft has an actuating geared member rocker arm, like for each cylinder. Each actuating member rocker is made of two finger followers and a roller bearing. The finger followers can rotate in relation to the roller by means of internal gear threads, and an electric motor attached to the end of the intermediate shaft. Also very important, is that the gear threads of the roller rocker, and finger followers, are in opposite direction. This means that when the shaft rotates, the roller member and finger followers will move in opposite direction, moving either apart or closer together. In this way, the axle angle between them can be varied infinitely, by the electric motor. The intake valve is actuated by camshaft, by the intermediate shaft. What we mean is that the camshaft acts on the roller member of intermediate shaft, transferring the movement to both finger followers, then, towards the roller rocker arms, and eventually to the intake valves. As you can see, when the finger follower is set at a narrow angle in relation to the roller member, it results in a low valve lift. When the angle of the finger follower is increased, the valve lift is also increased. In this way, valve matic can vary the valve lift by adjusting the angle of the finger followers. In the 2.0 liter valve matic engine, lift can vary from 1 slash 16 of an inch to half an inch. Valve matic saves the need of a throttle butterfly, thus reduce fuel consumption at low load. The high lift, like any other electronic valve lift system, enables a stronger top end power. The Toyota valve matic is one more system, among the many variable valve timing and lift developed lately, that allows the driver to experience two different engines in one. It is up to the automotive technician to get trained on these systems, and perform a one-shot auto diagnostic and repair.
VE Tech Core Variable Valve Timing and Lift Electronic Control is a valve timing system developed by Honda to improve the low RPM volume efficiency of van engine. This system uses two camshaft lobes and electronically selects between these profiles. The Honda VE Tech system has only two lobes as opposed to an infinitely variable valve timing system. So these two lobes control valve open time as well as lift at idle and at high RPMs. VE Tech systems were designed to provide improvements in fuel efficiency or increased power output as well as improved fuel efficiency. Rather than one cam lobe actuating each valve, VE Tech has two lobes. One optimized for low RPM stability and fuel efficiency, the other designed to maximize high RPM power output. Switching between the two cam lobes is controlled by the ECU, which takes into account engine oil pressure, speed, temperature, and throttle position. From these inputs, the ECU is programmed to switch from the low lift to the high lift cam lobes when the conditions dictate to do so. At the switch point, a solenoid is actuated, which allows oil pressure to operate a locking pin, binding the high RPM cam follower to the low RPM ones. From this point on, the poppet valve opens and closes according to the high lift profile, which opens the valve further and for a longer time. The switchover point is variable between a minimum and maximum parameter and is determined by engine load. The switch back from high to low RPM lobes is set at a lower engine speed and the up switch to avoid a situation in which the engine is asked to operate continuously at or around the switchover point. In other words, the ACM avoids staying at the switchover point during cruise. The VE Tech system is found on dual overhead cam systems as well as single overhead cam engines. The Honda VE Tech system is a full hydraulic system. On previous videos we saw how the higher cam lobe is engaged, but in actuality the synchronizing mechanism is internal to the rocker assembly. It is controlled by the ECM using a VE Tech solenoid and pressure sensor. First, let's start by pointing out that Honda has a habit of grounding solenoids at the body, and this system is no exception. The same principle of grounding at the body is also used in transmission shift solenoids. In this case, the VE Tech solenoid is grounded at the body itself, which is the reason why we see a single wire exiting the solenoid. Since the VE Tech system has only two possible settings, the solenoid is an on and off unit, as opposed to duty cycle controlled. Also bear in mind that the VE Tech hydraulic mechanism is engaged at higher RPMs. So at lower RPM, the system is off and no voltage is sent to the solenoid. With the solenoid disengaged, the system is in what Honda calls lost motion, which is when the center rocker just turns freely. As soon as RPM and load goes up, the center rocker is locked and VE Tech is active. 
This is done by the ECM providing 12 volts and the ground is taken from the body of the solenoid itself. Remember, the ECM is also monitoring the VE tech pressure sensor or switch at the same time, but on that later. Right away, there are a few possible problems that may arise with this system. One is to make sure the VE tech solenoid is grounded properly. This means double check the engine block ground. Check between solenoid and battery negative with a multimeter. You should see no more than 100 millivolts at idle. Then, at between 4000 to 6000 RPMs, test the solenoid 12 volt activation coming from the ECM. This is a big solenoid. Look for at least one amp. There are different variations on the market. Determine current draw from specifications. Use a large light bulb test light to draw some current through the circuit. If the 12 volt activation supply is good, then shut the engine off, remove the solenoid, and inspect the screen and ring. Other issues with this system are leaky rocker arms and low oil pressure. On the Honda VE Tech, the pressure sensor or switch is in charge of telling the ECM the on and off oil pressure during VE Tech actuation. This component is not a variable pressure sensor. It is an accurate on and off switch. The VE Tech coil pressure switch is a normally closed switch. The ECM sends a voltage to the switch and expects the voltage to go through the switch to ground. The ground is provided by the other wire seen here at the pressure switch. In a sense, the voltage is grounded at the switch when VE tech is off. If the ECM reads a voltage on that circuit when the VE tech system is not operating, it will turn on the check engine light and set a code. The VE tech code is a P1259 on vehicles with OBD2 or made after 1996. When the ECM energizes the VE tech solenoid valve to let hydraulic oil through, the ECM expects the oil pressure switch to open and see the voltage on the circuit. If there is a delay with oil pressure opening the switch, the ECM will set a treble code and limit fuel delivery, causing a drivability problem. Welcome to ADP Training, YouTube's automotive technology channel. In this channel, you'll learn all kinds of auto repair secrets, how your automobile works, and how to diagnose it. Hello everybody and welcome to another video. Today we are going to do a video on analyzing the cam and crank sensor signal. So we're going to do an analysis of these uh, waveforms. Now on, uh, on screen, as you can see, this is a typical uh, cam and crank signal taken from my library. Now. Uh, this particular signal was, um, this is, this is, I forgot, I really don't know which, which car this belongs to, but this is, uh, it's a good signal. Uh, now, I want you to pay attention to the correlation between cam and crank, and I'm going to show you a few, this is an older vehicle, that, that much I know. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, and this is a similar vehicle, uh, the bottom, uh, waveform, it's, the, the cam sensor, and the upper waveform is the crank sensor. We're going to do, we actually recorded a, uh, a complete uh, 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 waveform analysis, of actually a waveform on the scope, and we're going to play that for you towards, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a little bit, towards the, uh, in, the in the middle of the, of, of, the uh, uh, of the video. Okay, so again, this is the relationship between cam and crank. The upper one is the crank, the lower, the lower one is the, uh, the cam sensor. Now, <clears throat> on the next uh, shot that we have, we're going to show you how to use these two uh, uh, signals to know or to correlate them uh, and to know whether you have a, uh, a jumped timing belt or a stretched timing belt, timing chain, and so on and so forth. 
Now, as you can see on screen, we're going to use the uh, original, uh, you know, the software that we've always been using. Uh, now, pay attention to these two pulses at the bottom. This, this, is, this is the cam. Understand one thing. For every revolution of the cam, uh, for it's half a revolution of the crank. So the crank turns twice, okay, for, for every uh, cam revolution. So the cam turns twice, the crank turns once, okay? And this is important, okay? Because if you have a jumped or a stretched timing belt, you're going to know right away. And I'll, I'll show you how uh, uh, later on in the video. Now, as you can see, the top signal belongs to a uh, crank sensor. Uh, and, and it's always like that. It's always, uh, you know, you're going to have a bunch of pulses on the crank signal and a few pulses on the cam signal. Uh, because this, the cam signal, all it wants to do is tell the ECM uh, number one top dead center. From, uh, from number one top dead center. Now, this is, this is, I mean, this is why I, I actually show, I'm showing you this. These two pulses of the cam represents a complete crank revolution, okay? And this is important uh, because of, of the fact that you have to know how many pulses you're going to get of the crank per cam uh, pulse, okay? And that's going to determine uh, for many reasons. Uh, and in between the cursors here that you see, uh, this is a complete, uh, again, a complete crank shaft revolution, okay? Now, uh, if the timing chain or the timing belt is stretched, and this is the purpose really of this, uh, of this video, uh, to allow you to... Uh, determine if you have a stretch timing belt or timing chain without doing major disassembly by just looking at the cam and crank. Now, uh, you, you don't know that right now, but I want to show you how uh, in a little bit. Uh, but anyhow, let, let me just uh, uh, explain to you the relationship of, of cam and crank. Now, this is one pulse uh, on screen. Per, every, per, per pulse, you're going to see a couple of pulses on, on the crank. Now remember that the crank sensor has a reluctor wheel uh, with a bunch of little teeth. Uh, this is called the reluctor. These, the little teeth are, are, are called, as again, this reluctor has a correlation. You're supposed to have X amount, and, and I'm, I can't tell you how many because it depends on the year, make a model, or, or, and the engine size of whatever you're, you're fixing, you're, you're diagnosing. It doesn't really matter. You have to have yourself uh, a uh, a signal, uh, a good signal library. This is a must, okay? Uh, if not, you look it up online. Now, these days, uh, 20 years ago when I started doing this, you know, there was nothing uh, online. Uh, even Google wasn't that, <laughs> that great back then. <coughs> so, again, we're looking at half a crank um, uh, revolution, uh, one cam revolution, and we just changed it. Now, you su you're, what you do is you count the number, two things that you're supposed to do, either count the number of cycles uh, that you see on the crank, okay, or the numbers of cycles that you see on the cam, in between the cam poles, okay. And w again, I want to show you later on, I have actually have two uh, uh, shots that I did, uh, and I'm actually going to show you how to do that. As you can see on screen, uh, what, w what you're looking at, it's a, a snapshot, a screenshot of the uh, cam and crank uh, correlation. And right now I'm counting five uh, crank pulses per cam pulse. This is, one, this is one way to do it, okay? Now, this is supposed to be, not supposed to be, this is a recorded uh, waveform from a good known cam and crank. This is a running engine. Uh, there was nothing wrong with it, okay? And I think, I believe, this is an older vehicle, too. Uh, when I say older, uh, early 2000s, you know. Uh, again, now next, uh, we're going to see this. This is a, now you have two uh, crank um, pulses or cycles, you know, per cam pulse, okay? This uh, shows, uh, and this, is, this was a really, really, really awful running car. And this shows a stretched timing chain. This was actually, I think it was a Nissan, if I remember correctly. This is a 
definitely a stretch timing change. Sure enough, we pulled that out, and it was a disaster. Even the tensioner was, uh, all the guys were, were worn out, horrible. Uh, so, and this is, so this is an easy way to do it. Again, uh, you can also count the number of pulses, like we showed you before. Uh, you, what you do is you go between, you go two crank, two cam revolutions, okay? And then you count the number of pulses on the crank, okay? And that also tells you, but then you, you have to have a good known waveform. Once you, you get used to, uh, um, you know, doing this stuff, you're gonna be, uh, you're, you're gonna know more or less. You can also look at the um, crank, a uh, reluctor, and right away you count the number of, of, of teeth, you know, on the reluctor, and right away you know because these uh, pulses on the crank sensor are, this is the exact number of teeth that, that you have on the on the crank. Okay. Now, it it's a little bit of work. But it's a lot. It's a lot easier. It's a lot better than doing the disassembly and, and tearing down the engine uh, just to find out that there's nothing wrong with the cam, and y your issue is something else. Okay. So again, this is uh, another one of those uh, things that you can do with the oscilloscope, and which saves a lot of time. Okay. And that way, you'll be able to uh, um, b definitely do a lot with your diagnostics that way. Uh, so uh, anyhow. This is uh, has been uh, this is uh, the series that we're, we're running now. It's a cam uh, oscilloscope. Um, right now we're doing the cam and crank correlation uh, signal analysis, but this is uh, an oscilloscope uh, series that we're doing. Uh, again, uh, on screen you, you you know we show you exactly what you, we showed you before uh, uh, the correlation, and how to tell uh, tell whether you have a stretch timing chain. We'd like to thank you for tuning into our videos on our channel ADP Training. Uh, do a search on Google for automotive diagnostics and publishing. Subscribe to our website. We're always putting out free stuff. Okay. And uh, again, tomorrow we're, we're, we're doing another another campaign. And we're, I think we're giving out a, a free software. Okay. So thank you for tuning in to our, to our channel. And thank you for watching. This channel is for do-it-yourselfers, as well as professional auto repair technicians. We present all the content using the latest CG animation techniques, on hands video, and how to, tips and techniques. We encourage you to subscribe to this channel now. Once subscribed, anytime we upload a new automotive tip, secret, or technology video, you will be notified. Finally, by subscribing, you will also be part of our weekly freebies. Yes, we're constantly giving away lots of free merchandise. Automotive Diagnostics and Publishing's Mandy Concepcion, the owner of this channel, is one of the most prolific auto technology authors on the web. At any moment in time, we may offer a free book, Kindle eBook, Android app, one of our own diagnostic equipment, or even auto repair software that runs on your PC. Subscribe now free of charge. Learn lots of automotive technology secrets, and win free stuff. It doesn't get any better than that. Thanks for watching, and enjoy. Welcome to ADP Training, YouTube's automotive technology channel. In this channel, you'll learn all kinds of auto repair secrets, how your automobile works, and how to diagnose it. Hello everybody and welcome to another video. In today's video, we are going to t uh, talk about uh, glitch capture of the cam and crank sensor signal using the oscilloscope. And as you can see on screen, this is a three-wire, the, the Hall effect sensor, uh, which are 98% of crank sensor are Hall effect sensor, produces a square wave, as you can see on screen. Maximum of 5 volts, normally 95%, 98% of the time, and ground. Okay? And as you can see, this reluctor, the, the wheel the, that you see that, uh, that says reluctor, that's the, that is the crank uh, um, wheel. Or it could also be a wheel speed sensor on very few cases or the cam sensor. Uh, it's just a tooth wheel that actually introduces the signal. Uh, you do, uh, you're supposed to do tests, and we're going to show you how to do these tests at the end of the video. Uh, uh, one side of the sensor usually is connected to either 12 volts or, or 5 volts. The other side is connected to ground and then there's the signal voltage, the one that you see in the middle. Uh, it is the, the job of this sensor to
to toggle this signal voltage between ground and 5 volts. They're usually 95% of the time or more 5 volts, okay? And as you can see on screen, that was the, uh, uh, I'm going to show you how to test, uh, uh, you know, the signal uh, using the, the scope uh, next. Uh, but anyhow, uh, it's very, it's a very, it's, it's a very straightforward sensor, okay? Um, it has an internal transistor, uh, and it, the, the transistor is the one that toggles the, sig the 5 volt at the signal line between 5 volt and ground. And next we're going to see uh, exactly what it looks like on the oscilloscope. Now, as you can see on the scope, we have other videos uh, uh, on this channel that actually deal with using this particular scope. Okay, uh, the scope itself, it's, uh, we actually offer the scope. Uh, all, you ha all you have to do is send us an email and ask us for the scope. Anyhow, so this is the, the signal that you saw before uh, briefly on the uh, introduction of the video. It is a square wave signal, okay? And we're going to touch upon, uh, upon two uh, aspects of this signal. And at the end, uh, towards the end of the video, we're going to show you how to actually do ma the manual testing that you're going to have to see. Now, we're going to use the cursors, as you can see on screen. Uh, these cursors, the bottom one is a zero volt, okay? The upper, which is the yellow one. The blue one on the top is the maximum, which is a 5 volt, okay? That's what these two lines are going to signify, ground and 5 volts, okay? And keep that in mind, okay? We're going to mess around with the signal a little bit. Uh, this is a simulated signal, but it is an actual signal produced uh, by a, a, a signal simulator. Uh, anyhow, uh, so we are showing you right now uh, about one, two, three and a half uh, cycles of the waveform, okay? Uh, these cycles are, of course, depending on the speed of the engine or the speed of the wheel speed uh, uh, si signal, how fast the wheels are turning, or the cam sensor. Uh, so this this, this, this this sensor is a triple, or, or even more so, you know, it, it's actually used on a, on a bunch of, it's also used inside the transmission as an input speed sensor, uh, output speed sensor, vehicle speed sensor, and so on and so forth. Anyhow, so going back to the signal itself. Uh, the first thing that we have to, we're going to do now is we're going to expand the signal a little bit, as you can see on screen, and we're going to show you, uh, this is about two cycles, okay? And we're going to move the, z the, uh, the, the, uh, the trigger line, okay? So that it actually, it, it shows better on screen, pretty much. Okay, so anyhow, uh, right now, uh, the bottom line is the zero volt line, as we explained before. The upper one is the maximum which is usually 5 volts, okay? Uh, all you got to do is go to your uh, uh, sensor itself and you're going to know if it's a 5 volt reference or not. 95% of the time it's going to be 5 volt reference. Now, this, the, what you can s as you can see on screen, this is an issue that, you, that I want you to learn how to test, okay? The upper part of the, uh, of the wave not reaching 5 volts, okay? Not reaching 5 volts. There's a little gap in there, okay? This gap cannot be more than 150 milli, uh, millivolts or so, okay? And if it's more than 200 millivolts, it's too much. 0.2 volts, it's just too much. It starts creating problems, okay? So try and stay, whenever you talk about signals within 100 millivolts, that's a rule of thumb, okay? Now, again, uh, you want to see, uh, in this particular case, we're simulating an issue with this signal. This is exactly what happens. What could possibly be the problem here? Could it be the sensor? Could it be, could it be the wiring? Uh, by analyzing this signal, uh, there's a 90%, 85% eighty chance that there is a, an issue with the wire, okay? Because it's not reaching 5 volts. It could also be the sensor, but 9 times out of 10 it's not, okay? Uh, again, you know, it's, uh, you, all you got to do is do your testing. Okay, if you, if you go to the sensor, you disconnect the sensor, you measure the 5 volts in there, and it's, and it's not 5 volts, and you know uh, it's the wire without a shadow of a doubt. Okay, now, uh, we are actually now going to show you, uh, we're going to do that next. Uh, if this signal, as, as I explained before, if it's a huge gap, as you see right now, forget it. It's, the ECM is never going to recognize that signal. It, because the signal is not able to ground, it's not able to uh, toggle. Uh, there's something wrong with the wires, okay? Nine times out of ten, okay? 
because you're seeing it on the waveform. You know that the sensor is switching, so there is nothing wrong with the sensor itself in that respect. So it is, it is triggering the base of the transistor inside the sensor. These sensors have an internal transistor. Okay. Now, uh, the other issue, and we're going to explain that next, is the ground, the ground side. Uh, but anyhow, so again, try to say, you know, make sure that the gap between the, 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 the upper side and, and the, on the upper part of the waveform is not too great. Now, for the ground, as you can see on screen, uh, this has to be 100% on the money. There is no 100 millivolts in there. You cannot forget it. You know, it, it has to be grounded properly. Okay, maybe 10 or 20 millivolts is fine, uh, but for signals, every, everybody has to be grounded. Every, everybody has to be on the same. You know, it's, it's not like Republicans and Democrats. No, this is not like that. This is ground. The ground, everybody has to be one or the other, but everybody has to be the same. Anyhow, so uh, going back to the, uh, to, to the ground side, as you can see, there is also a gap here. We're simulating a gap, okay, between the ground and the lower part of the, of the, uh, of the signal, okay, of the, of the, this is a square wave signal, okay? In this particular case, this thing has to be right on the money. We're going to expand in a little bit. We're going to expand the signal, um, uh, the amplitude, so that as we that we can explain to you a little bit better, you know how this, uh, what you have to look for. But right away, as soon as you see this, okay, there's something wrong, and there's something wrong with the ground, not necessarily the signal itself. This sensor is not able to ground the signal 100%. Why? Because the ground wire, and you have to test your ground wires that we're going to explain uh, next after, uh, you know, towards the, as I get, when we finish the explanation of the waveform. Uh, anyhow, so uh, as you can see here, uh, this is not right. There's something wrong with this, okay? And you have to uh, basically, f this is a wiring problem. You have to find out what's going on. Uh, now we're expanding the signal so that we could actually do a better explanation uh, of what's going on here, okay? And basically what we're going to do is we're going to move move the ground, uh, I mean the zero line a little bit further up so that we can actually test, show you what it means, you know? Uh, again, as you can see now the gap is even greater, not because, because of anything in particular, is you, we, change, uh, we change the amplitude Okay, and then we ch and we change we move the signal upwards so that we can show you that gap between ground, which is the yellow line, and the bottom part of the of the waveform. Okay, as I said, this cannot be if it's uh, if it's 20 millivolts, it's it's already starting to be a problem. Okay, uh, and again, you have to do a voltage drop test uh, between uh, battery and and the actual ground. I know you're measuring between ground and ground. That, that tells you right away, if you have voltage between ground and ground, you have an issue. You found your problem already. Then you have to tackle the problem, either run a new wire or, or find the issue itself. If you've, if you've seen that, the, you know, usually you, uh, the ECM has a bunch of ground lines going to it, okay? Uh, sometimes as, as many as eight or even ten ground lines, okay? I have customers who, who call me and, and they tell me, no, we, you know, we're seeing 12 and 14 ground lines on some computers. Uh, that's incredible, but that's just the way it is. Uh, so anyhow, one of these uh, lost grounds, it's a problem, okay? So you have to do a voltage drop test between ground and ground, between battery ground and whatever ground you're testing. It should be zero, okay? If it's 20 millivolts, which is 0 0.020, okay? That's, uh, that's the beginning of, of, of a problem, okay? Uh, anyhow, so going back to this thing here, uh, you know, this is an issue, okay? You have to test it, test the wires, uh, make sure that everybody's on the same plane. Uh, you may want to check all your uh, ECM grounds, even if that takes a long time, but that's just the way it is, you know, you, the, this is, this, that's why it's called diagnostics. And you should be charging, you know, some parts of the country are charging $150 per diagnostic, some are 120 is the norm. Uh, if it's a, like the, uh, you know, if, uh, I'm going to say a poorer state, you know, then you charge at least $85, you know, because you're going to spend time doing this, this thing and you should be uh, compensated for it. Uh, so anyhow, so this, it's the most important part of this video. You have to look, look at this video and put it inside your head. This is a no-no, the big gap. Now, we're going to see on screen 
uh, the actual tests uh, that we can that we're actually uh, and this is the Hall effect sensor again it's a 5 volt reference this particular one some sometimes it's 12 volts you know sometimes it's not okay uh, signal and ground okay and the ECM side you could see it uh, now this is a a test of the ground wire this is a voltage drop test of the ground wire you should see zero okay uh, maybe point 0.1 okay point, point zero 0.01 not even point 0.1 and this another one this is a voltage drop test between the ground on the sensor itself and the battery ground again you should see zero and that's pretty much it you know as far as the uh, uh, you know, all these tests now we'd like to uh, uh, thank you for tuning in to our channel ADP training uh, uh, subscribe to our website we have a bunch of free stuff all the time okay so make sure that you do uh, um, you subscribe to our website if, if you think that that whatever we produce it's uh, of use uh, to uh, useful to you to you guys okay it's automotive diagnostics and publishing dot com auto diagnostics and publishing dot com uh, on our channel here uh, you can actually request not on the channel because I cannot do uh, send you a uh, a link through the channel itself uh, but you can actually do it um, through the uh, uh, through, through the website or through email sales uh, at autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com you can request a free copy of this oscilloscope that runs on your sound card on your computer okay uh, but anyhow so uh, and uh, again uh, our channel ADP training if you like to uh, uh, sponsor us you know you or, or be a patron you know give us uh, 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 any donations uh, we appreciate it okay uh, we we can do you know this is a free channel but it costs money to do all this stuff anyhow thank you for tuning in and thank you for watching this channel is for do-it-yourselfers as well as professional auto repair technicians we present all the content using the latest CG animation techniques on hands video and how to tips and techniques we encourage you to subscribe to this channel now once subscribed Anytime we upload a new automotive tip, secret, or technology video, you will be notified. Finally, by subscribing, you will also be part of our weekly freebies. Yes, we're constantly giving away lots of free merchandise. Automotive Diagnostics and Publishing's Mandy Concepcion, the owner of this channel, is one of the most prolific auto technology authors on the web. At any moment in time, we may offer a free book. Kindle ebook, Android app, one of our own diagnostic equipment, or even auto repair software that runs on your PC. Subscribe now free of charge, learn lots of automotive technology secrets, and win free stuff. It doesn't get any better than that. Thanks for watching, and enjoy. Welcome to ADP Training, YouTube's automotive technology channel. In this channel, you'll learn all kinds of auto repair secrets, how your automobile works, and how to diagnose it. Hello everybody and welcome to another video. In this video, we are going to talk a little bit about the um, our vacuum transducer and how to use it for testing. We're not going to go too deep into it. This is a very basic video. I'm just exposing you guys that to, to the tool, that we have this tool. We actually make it, we manufacture this tool, uh, but there is a lot behind it, uh, and basically we're just gonna show you what it's all about. Now the tool uh, comes uh, in its own pouch, uh, and basically it's uh, made out of uh, reinforced aluminum with um, uh, some carbon fiber uh, around it. Uh, so it's a tough unit. Uh, so you can see on screen, this is a BNC, has a BNC connector that goes to your oscilloscope. Uh, so it's a rugged unit, uh, there's not that much to say, it's, it's a very simple unit, it has a, uh, a fitting to do, to take vacuum readings, vacuum and exhaust readings, okay? It's important that you understand that this also will do exhaust uh, readings. So it, it, we have another unit for compression, that, does that uh, compression transducer. Now. Uh, it also comes with a, uh, you can see on screen right now, with a, uh, uh, a software, an oscilloscope software. So you don't really need to buy an oscilloscope. It's a basic uh, scope software, but you don't really, you, you don't need to buy any oscilloscope. 
Now the scope software that you, uh, that you get is slightly different than the free version that we offer, that we've offered um, you know, on our website. Um, but it's, a, it's also f included with the, with the unit and it basically uses your uh, sound card uh, as, a, um, as an input. Okay, and that's, uh, but we, we actually, we give you, uh, when you buy the scope, we give you um, like a circuit, it's like a little box in there that you plug in there, and it actually s conditions the signal for you so that you don't blow your sound card uh, or your laptop or, or probably a laptop that, that you're going to be using. Now, uh, having said that, it's a nice uh, unit. Uh, uh, it, it's, it, it depends on the sound card that you have on your, but it's, I mean, anything made after the last 15 years is fine. Uh, so you'll be okay. Now, um, on screen, as you can see on screen, this is a typical, um, and we're not going to go too deep into this, but it's, this is a typical signal that you would see with this particular. Uh, if you look carefully on the, uh, on the screen, you're going to see a yellow, the little yellow spikes. That's just your, your ignition for uh, this, the whatever cylinder you're trying to look at. Okay, uh, so these yellow spikes are the ignition signal, which would be channel channel number two, um, connected to the uh, to the ignition primary, and then the actual green uh, waveform is the actual the, the you know the vacuum uh, signal that you're getting from the transducer itself. Uh, if you look at the unit, if you look at the signal, uh, and again we're just briefly covering you know uh, you know how to read the, the, the this stuff, you would see that. After each spike, in other words, after, after each ignition event, you're going to see a, a waveform. You're going to see a, a crest, okay? But there's one, which is in this particular case will be 1342. That's the firing order. This is a four-cylinder. So 1342, the fourth, the, the third uh, arrow that you see there has no uh, crest whatsoever, okay? And that tells you that you have an issue with 134. Signal number four has an issue um, with the, uh, in this particular case, this is a, the uh, vacuum uh, signal. There's got to be a, a, an issue with other, either valves, piston rings, uh, things of, you know, uh, uh, a cam, uh, the cam lobe, maybe it's worn out, something like that, because you're getting an issue. Oftentimes, it's, it's not this bad, but you would see it's a crest. Uh, that, that doesn't go as high as the other ones, okay? And in that case, it's a, it's a dead giveaway. That you don't have, if, say you're having, for example, a misfire, misfire condition, you know for a fact that this is related uh, to a mechanical problem. This is the fastest way, by the way, to ascertain, okay, that you're having a mechanical issue without going deeper, deeper, deeper uh, in, into your uh, uh, do, doing tests bunch of different tests that you would have to do uh, this is this is the easiest way to do it uh, so you know again uh, you know we're showing again the uh, what the, the unit looks like we'd like to thank you for tuning in to our videos on our channel ADP training uh, and also the uh, uh, go to our website and subscribe to our website because we all, we're always giving free stuff on our website uh, on our website, you can also donate a little bit to my channel, to my YouTube channel, this channel here. Uh, we depend on, on, on your likes and your donations to continue with it because this is it's a lot of work and, you know, basically it's, there's nothing to it uh, for you guys to donate a little bit of money. It, we would really appreciate it. You know, we're not asking for a whole lot of money, whatever you can, you can spare, you know. Anyhow, so we'd like to thank, uh, thank you for tuning into our video, uh, our videos, uh, our channel ADP training, our website, autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com, and thank you so much for watching our videos. This channel is for do-it-yourselfers, as well as professional auto repair technicians. We present all the content using the latest CG animation techniques, on hands video, and how-to, tips and techniques. We encourage you to subscribe to this channel now. Once subscribed, anytime we upload a new automotive tip, secret, or technology video, you will be notified. Finally, by subscribing, you will also be part of our weekly freebies. Yes, we're constantly giving away lots of free merchandise. Automotive Diagnostics and Publishing's Mandy Concepcion, the owner of this channel, is one of the most prolific auto technology authors on the web.
At any moment in time, we may offer a free book, Kindle eBook, Android app, one of our own diagnostic equipment, or even auto repair software that runs on your PC. Subscribe now free of charge, learn lots of automotive technology secrets, and win free stuff. It doesn't get any better than that. Thanks for watching, and enjoy. Welcome to ADP Training, YouTube's automotive technology channel. In this channel, you'll learn all kinds of auto repair secrets, how your automobile works, and how to diagnose it. Hello everybody and welcome to another video. In today's video, we are going to uh, talk about uh, compression transducer testing waveform interpretation. This is uh, going to be a little bit of a, of a tougher uh, video. Uh, and basically, we're going to show you how to interpret the waveform. Uh, on screen now, you can see we also offer a book uh, together with, the, uh, uh, with this uh, uh, transducer that we actually manufacture at autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com, uh, as you can see on screen. This is the, the, vi the, on the video you can actually see what the um, transducer looks like. Now, for your information, the transducer, could, it's uh, actually aluminum, but it's uh, shrouded or surrounded on the outside. And we started doing this a few years back with a um, uh, sort of like a, uh, it's, a it's an epoxy uh, carbon fiber cover uh, just for better protection and so on. Uh, so it could be either or, okay? Now, uh, and this is the transducer as it comes, as you can see on screen. It comes with a, a little uh, package with the hoses, and uh, you're going to have probably going to be adapting other other hoses to it in the future uh, that you already have, you know. Uh, but this is uh, the transducer as you see it right now on screen. Um, again, it comes in a it's either a pouch or a plastic enclosure, like you see on screen. Either or, uh, it depends on the availability at that point in time. But the transducer is the same; it's just the uh, the cover. Um, you know the container anyhow so it comes with uh, all the adapters it comes with the transducer it comes with the hoses for the uh, it's like a compression hose pretty much uh, there's two types of uh, comes with two different types of um, uh, spark plugs you know the, the holes on the spark plugs that, that, that's what's available today uh, you may uh, be able to adapt not me may, may you you will be adapting other adapters at the end uh, like spark plug adapters uh, at the end, uh, so it's up to you. Uh, whatever you do, you know, it's uh, you already have the, the the components in there, and whatever you, if you wanna, for the future, you never know what kind of uh, uh, adapters uh, or spark plugs, you know, could come out of uh, on the market. And so this is uh, pretty much what you get um, with the uh, uh, with the transducer. We also have a vacuum peak transducer. The vacuum peak, is, it looks exactly the same, but it doesn't have the same fittings in the front. Uh, these are metal fittings made for compression. 
uh, on the vacuum peak it's uh, has a vacuum hose output um, you know that's made for vacuum <laughs> pretty much now uh, also you also see as you can see on screen there's also a BNC connector that's what goes to the scope uh, to the oscilloscope we also offer with this transducer a software that you that it's an oscilloscope software that you connect uh, to the uh, your laptop uh, um, microphone uh, and that's how it captures the waveform and it also comes with a little box for you to uh, modulate the gain of the transducer meaning the, the, the output frequency and not the frequency the, the voltage anyhow but it comes with uh, a, a, an included basic oscilloscope waveform as you can see on screen right now now this isn't a you know super duper you know uh, oscilloscope uh, you can get that from our website to autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com so this is a, a basic uh, oscilloscope it actually connects to your um, uh, uh, microphone output uh, actually input on, on, the, on your laptop and this is what you would see and we're going to explain what this means you know, in a little while okay which is the hardest part of the video uh, so basically this is a single cylinder saved waveform and this is this is uh, uh, following you would see uh, this is what a one cylinder waveform looks like of course of course this particular waveform has an issue uh, but we're gonna go through it uh, you know in a, in a couple of minutes and explain to you there's many ways that you can use the transducer and and it, it's it's important because it, it actually saves you lots of time and money now in this particular waveform you can actually see uh, the actual uh, rotation a complete rotation of your piston of your crankshaft uh, these are um, 180 degrees uh, spaced out okay uh, and to analyze the compression away from divide by uh, divided into 180 degrees intervals or divisions uh, basically uh, you, you basically want to see what each uh, event in this particular waveform means and as you can see on screen uh, each of each of these events means something uh, what do they mean well as you see on screen power cycle the exhaust cycle the uh, intake cycle and the compression cycle and that's what you're by studying uh, what happens you can pretty much know what your issue is if it's uh, uh, a compression issue uh, you would know if it's the exhaust valve if it's if it's not the exhaust valve or if it's not the valves at all you know oftentimes you have a misfire what is it it's an ignition it's an injection it's a compression you don't know the only way to know is by doing tests by just on, on screwing a spark plug and plugging in this transducer you would know exactly what's wrong following our we actually show on in the same way from the specific events for top dead center and bottom dead center and that'll tell you exactly uh, uh, what the issue is uh, in this particular waveform the peak compression right before sp uh, spark and detonation okay of the spark okay this is important because this tells you if you have good compression uh, then you have that low um, it's like a like a bottoming um, a crest of the waveform and this is the lower mo most point on your waveform meaning proper exhaust and this is another one this is another helpful helpful hint because if you don't have proper exhaust then you have a clock catalytic converter or a clock muffler or wh what have you so this particular this test uh, with the uh, compression peak transducer uh, would help you uh, determine if you have an issue with your uh, not only the valve train but also the pistons and, uh, and the exhaust uh, following we also see the exhaust section okay and this is important the exhaust se section tells you in this particular uh, uh, waveform we're missing something in there you know uh, uh, and then later on you you see the intake section okay where they're both missing uh, in this particular case uh, then you have the again the compression uh, section um, on the waveform <coughs> finally we see on an intake or exhaust event we see that the, the um, uh, valves not sealing properly and this is the sort of thing that you see uh, when you actually when you use the compression the compact transducer 
you don't have to do extensive testing or anything like that. It, it, it saves you lots of time uh, and, and money, of course. Now, uh, we also, uh, this is the, the final shot, that, and this is, again, there's there's a lot more information that you could gain from 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 the from the compact transducer, but we're just touching the the, the crest uh, of what you could do. Uh, so this is uh, what we saw before. This is point C through F's. Uh, okay, uh, is the exhaust pressure uh, during the exhaust stroke. Okay, uh, this section should be one sixth or to one ninth of the peak compression value. It points to restrictions in the exhaust system. Uh, now it's uh, you know it's incredible how much you could do uh, with this piece of equipment, uh, pretty much. And uh, so anyhow, it's uh, it is what it is. So we just thought we would show you how to read. It comes with a manual. It comes with a book that you would you're going to need to study it uh, to be able to gain uh, some interpretation uh, knowledge of how to do this. But if you if you're good at this. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna be top notch, you know, when it comes to your uh, repair shop being uh, on top of uh, of diagnostics, and you're not gonna spend. You're gonna save money on the parts alone that you're gonna uh, that you're gonna save uh, by not swapping parts or replacing, uh, uh, you know, uh, re replacing components that you don't need to replace. Anyhow, uh, we like to thank you for tuning in to our channel ADP Training. Uh, uh, and also uh, subscribe to our website autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com. Uh, we all we're always offering free stuff on our website. So um, you know, uh, just give us a thumbs up if you like the video, or uh, post a comment, or what have you. Anyhow, uh, thank you for uh, watching, and thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. This channel is for do-it-yourselfers as well as professional auto repair technicians. We present all the content using the latest CG animation techniques, on hands video, and how to, tips and techniques. We encourage you to subscribe to this channel now. Once subscribed, anytime we upload a new automotive tip, secret, or technology video, you will be notified. Finally, by subscribing, you will also be part of our weekly freebies. Yes, we're constantly giving away lots of free merchandise. Automotive Diagnostics and Publishing's Mandy Concepcion, the owner of this channel, is one of the most prolific auto technology authors on the web. At any moment in time, we may offer a free book, Kindle eBook, Android app, one of our own diagnostic equipment, or even auto repair software that runs on your PC. Subscribe now free of charge, learn lots of automotive technology secrets, and win free stuff. It doesn't get any better than that. Thanks for watching, and enjoy. This channel is for do-it-yourselfers, as well as professional auto repair technicians. We present all the content using the latest CG animation techniques, on hands video, and how to, tips and techniques. We encourage you to subscribe to this channel now. Once subscribed, anytime we upload a new automotive tip, secret, or technology video, you will be notified. Finally, by subscribing, you will also be part of our weekly freebies. Yes, we're constantly giving away lots of free merchandise. Automotive Diagnostics and Publishing's Mandy Concepcion, the owner of this channel, is one of the most prolific auto technology authors on the web. At any moment in time, we may offer a free book, Kindle eBook, Android app, one of our own diagnostic equipment, or even auto repair software that runs on your PC. Subscribe now free of charge, learn lots of automotive technology secrets, and win free stuff. It doesn't get any better than that. Thanks for watching, and enjoy.